starting a new series called Love Your Neighbor. And here is where we get the text from today and for the month. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 says, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. The second is equally as important, and that's to love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Here is Jesus talking, and he's saying, listen, I want you to know there are 10 commandments. He's talking about the law here. He's talking about the commandments. He's like, listen, I want you to know the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And then is equally, the second equally as important, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, these are the greatest commandments. So that means these are more important for us to live out and walk out than the other commandments. It's important that we would be people that love our neighbors and love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so today I want to talk to you just for a few moments on how do we do that. We're going to break that down for the next few weeks in different ways. And today I want to talk to you from the story of the Good Samaritan. Many of you probably know the Good Samaritan story. Jesus is talking and he says, listen, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And then uh, one of the, the religious leaders comes to him and says, okay, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And so here's what Jesus says. He tells a story. He says he doesn't just answer him. He then tells a story. There was a Samaritan man. Many of you know the story. I'll just say it for the sake of time. We'll break it down for a second in a moment. He says, I want you to know there's this Samaritan man, he's walking, or this Jew that's walking uh, down this road to Jericho, and he says, there's these, these, these men attack him. They beat him up and they leave him for dead. They rob him, they leave him for dead. That says, this priest comes walking by. The priest comes walking by, and the priest sees him. The Bible says that the priest sees him and actually crosses the street and walks the other way and keeps walking. Then it says a Levite, a, pre, a temple worker, if you will. They, he sees him. He walks by. He sees him. He crosses the street and goes the other way. Then the Bible says this Samaritan. Actually, one of the translations says a despised Samaritan. He says he sees the Jew. The Bible says that he gets on his knees and he begins to take care of him. He bandages his wounds. He puts him on his donkey and he carries him to an inn. And then he, get, he pays the inn to continue to care for him. And he says, listen, if this isn't enough money, when I come back, I'll pay you even more because I want to, I want to make sure this man's okay. Then Jesus asks the Pharisee, he says, which of those do you think was a neighbor? Which of those do you think was the neighbor that we're talking about when we say love your neighbor as yourself? And the man says, obviously, it's, it's, it's Jesus. It, obviously, it's the Samaritan. And I want to show it to you in, in Luke chapter 10 and verse uh, 36. It says, now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. See, Jesus wasn't just about telling stories. What he wanted to do is he wanted to provoke thought processes to challenge us to go and do the same. So here's what he's saying. He's saying this man's thinking, okay, who's my neighbor? What the man's trying to do is figure out who it is he's supposed to love. How much is he supposed to do in order to etern earn eternal uh, favor, to earn favor with God, to earn uh, an opportunity to get to heaven? And so he says, who is it? Because I want to know who exactly I'm supposed to love because these are the most important commandments. And so then Jesus doesn't answer him on who. He tells a story and he says, now which ones do you think it is? He says, the Samaritan. He says, now, okay, now you understand. Go and do the same. What he was saying was, it's not a certain person. It is people of all, all places and all people and all races and all nations and all, and all tongues. And he wants you to go. And people are hurting, that not hurting. He wants you to go and love them. And he wants us to do the same. So here's what I want to talk to you today about. I want to talk to you from this story of this Good Samaritan story. I want to talk to you on the topic of this is bringing unity to a divided world. Bringing unity to a divided world. Now, you may be, how in the world and what in the world are you talking about through Good Samaritan with bringing unity to a divided world? One of the greatest ways we could be good neighbors is to have unity. One of the greatest ways to be a good neighbor is to have unity. Let me explain. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12 and verse 29, it says the most important commandment is, listen, no, that's not the one I want. Let's keep going. I want to give you uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 33. It says, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. The, a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Here's what's cool about the story. And many of you probably know this. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. 
Not only did Jews and Samaritans not get along, they were completely against one another. In fact, considered hated one another. In fact, you were considered despised if that you were caught even talking or hanging with a Samaritan. And so that's why it says a despised Samaritan. It's this thought process of this, this Jew. And the person that was least likely to help this man helps him. See, the priest walks by. The priest is, is the guy that is overseeing the temple. Now, most people think the priest should be the one to do the act of what he's supposed to do, of loving people and caring for people and having compassion for people. The priest walks and goes the other way. A temple worker, someone who works, a staff member of a church, if you will, is the way we can look at it in our day and age. It, it, it sees him, and he walks the other way. And then someone who is despised, someone who would consider be considered have racial divide between this person. He says, you know what? I'm going to put down and lay aside my racial divide and I'm going to love this person why because I understand God created this person and so here's what I want to talk to you today about from this story I want to talk to you about living and with unity within ourselves and with us because we're living in a divided world let me just tell you something if you don't know our world is divided I don't know if I've ever seen a time in our history the history of our country where we have been more divided You can read history books. I don't know. We are completely divided in every area. We're divided racially. We're divided uh, economically. We're divided politically. We are all so divided. If you don't believe me, I don't know about you, but you probably, some of you did, you probably could, could have sat and watched for two minutes on Tuesday night the debates, and you probably realized real quick we're a divided nation. I don't know about you, but I, this is the truth. I'm just being honest with you. For those who are watching online, I'm being honest with you. Like this is, I, I fin- we watched that and after watching, I almost, I turned it off and I almost felt discouraged. It was like, oh my gosh, this, our country, where have we, how have we gotten to this? To where literally we're, it's just yell at each other and just attack one another. And, fa- and it's, here's the thing. We all look at that and like, oh, that's just the president's. No, it's not. That's just the presidential candidates. No, it's not. We are living in a society where everyone wants to be divided about something that they disagree with. Here's what's happened in our country. Let's just talk for a second. We have become people through our differences. It's allowed us to create disagreements. And through our disagreements, it's now causing division in our country, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community. Here's what it is. Our differences were never meant to divide us. Our differences were always meant to unite us. But we as a country and we as a people and Christians as well, we have been a people that what we've done is we've looked at someone else and we said, your differences don't make me comfortable. And so now I'm going to disagree with the way you're living your life, with the way you're choosing to vote, with the way that you're doing things, whatever it is. And so now I'm gonna, it's going to cause me to distance myself. And then it's, there's division between us. And so now because there's division, there can be frustrations and angers in, in our lives. And so now as a country as Christians, not just the the world, the Christians too, we've created this concept in our hearts where we've allowed ourselves to justify why we have division towards someone else. The Bible says that we're never to be divided. Actually, if you want to read it, I want to read it to you in in, uh, Mark chapter 3 and verse 24. It says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, aka a country, if a country is divided against itself, the kingdom or the country cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Meaning this, what does that mean? If there's, there's division in a house or a country, what's going to happen is that that house or that country cannot stand. Here is what the enemy knows. The enemy knows he doesn't have to attack us from the outside. The enemy knows all he's got to do is attack us from the inside. And then from attacking us from the inside, we create, we create division in ourselves, and we end up splitting off and creating division in our own lives. See, the enemy wants to create division in us. Why? Because he knows if there's division, there's no unity. And unity is what is, the, I believe, the greatest force to com- complete a, a mission of what we're supposed to do. We are living in a day and age, hear me, we're living in a day and age where there's division everywhere for all different things. And I know it's just the enemy. And here's what it is. Here's what, what creates division. Really, it's just fear. Fear is what creates division, and what, what, uh, this is what I just, just, just talking here for a second. This is what I believe. It's, you know, the fear of loss, 
then allows us to start being have division between one another. Why? Because I believe that if I lose this, then you're going to have this, and then I'm not going to have this, and if I don't have this, and so then my life's not going to be good. And so now I have to have division against you. Why? Because I don't want what you want. I don't want what you have to win. Because then if I if I don't win, and then my life's going to be lost. I'm going to lose this, and it's all craziness. Here's what's crazy. Here's what's crazy. If you really look at it, the 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 biggest fear of COVID nineteen, which it's a real virus, but the biggest fear is the loss of life. And so through the loss of life, there's been this, this, this fear of it, and so now we don't want to face it. Now we want to know who's going to do what, what's going to do what. And we, so we, we have this fear. It's the same thing with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, political parties. Oh, my gosh, it's crazy. I don't know if y'all get, are getting the text messages, but I'm getting text messages like 12 times a day. Anybody else, you know what I'm saying? Like you're getting mail, you're getting emails, you're getting on your Insta, you're getting on your Facebook, you're getting in your, you're getting in your, in your mailbox, you're getting it on, on your phones. It's just, and here's what everybody keeps saying on both parties. Here's what everybody keeps saying. Don't let so-and-so win because they will ruin the country. I must have heard from both political parties a thousand times that so-and-so is going to ruin the country. So -so so-and-so is going to ruin the country, and -and so-and-so is going to ruin the country, and the libertarians, so-and-so is going to ruin the country. Here's where we are. That means the country's ruined. Because there's no hope, because everybody's going to ruin the country. So here's, here's, here's what I want to encourage you with, though. Here's what I want to encourage you with. Let me explain. We're talking about division here. See, if, if you're a Republican, then you, you, what you say is the Democratic, Democratic Party is going to ruin the country. And so now if you vote Democrat, now I have something against you because I don't want the country ruined. I don't want to lose what I have in this country. If you're, if you're a Democrat, you look at the Republicans and you think the Republican Party is going to ruin the country. So now what you do is you say, you look at them and you say, no, I don't want you to, I'm against you. Why? Because you're voting for someone. <gasps> How can you vote for someone? How can you? <gasps> <gasps> and the next thing you know, there's division. And all because we, we have this thought process of this loss that's going to happen. When let me just encourage you, no matter who gets voted in in November, God is still on the throne. He's still on the throne. Let me tell you something. The country's not going to ruins because of a president. The country's going to go into ruins if there's division in the people. So it's up to us as a church. What This is, again, this is what I keep telling people. I keep telling people. I keep telling people. I keep telling people. In a time period where there's so much division, there's no greater time for the church to stand up in unity and shine. Can I just, just for a second, oh my goodness, let me just encourage you for a second. Like, let me, we're just going to talk for a second. That's all right. Like, Jesus isn't a Republican. Did y'all know Jesus was, isn't a Democrat? All the libertarians are like, I knew it. Can I just encourage you? Jesus isn't a libertarian. Jesus is not affiliating himself with a political party. Why? Because Jesus is kingdom-minded. He's more concerned about kingdom business. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to preach for a second. I'm, I'm getting worked up up here. I'm getting so worked up. It, it, it just infuriates me because we allow the enemy to create fear in our lives. And so then we be, create this division between one another that gets so overwhelming that literally then we all think it's all over. Oh, no. Can I encourage you? God is more concerned. Oh, my goodness. He's more concerned about your unity with one another than what political party you affiliate yourself with. And so it's so important that we would learn this, that we would say, okay, I want to have, in a time period of where there's so much division, I want to have unity between us. How do we do that? I want to give you three quick things very quickly. I want to show it to you, and I believe it's so important on how we create unity in a divided world. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, it says, and you must love the Lord your God, (coughs) excuse me, with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and all of your strength. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. If we really want to create unity as a church, and when I say a church, I mean the body of believers, not just our church, all churches, all Christians. We should have unity between one another. If we really want to do that, we have to first realize this. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is, he always has been, and he always will be the answer. 
If you were looking to a man or a woman to create unity in our country, in our world, I'm telling you right now, you're looking in the wrong direction. Jesus is the only person, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Jesus is the only person that can fix the racial divide in our country. Jesus is. Not a man, not a woman, not a political party. We as Christians hear me and we have to stand up for this. We have waited too long for a bill to pass to create racial unity. Racial unity starts with us. What are we going to do? How are we going to create unity? How are we going to love one another in such a way where we allow unity to be together in racial issues in our country? Not, okay, pass this bill. Let me tell you something. A bill is not what fixes things. It's Jesus. He is the answer. He always is and he always will be. Let me tell you something. This gives me an assurance and it gives me an opportunity to be able to rest because I can trust and know. It's almost like a, because I don't have to worry about what so-and-so says on TV. Why? Because I know that Jesus is the answer. And so if he's the answer, I put my life in his hands and I know he's going to take care of us. The church has to stand up. Let me tell you something. We are living in times the church must stand up and be a place that people see unity in us. Nobody should see more love in any place more than the church. There should be no place on the planet that you can go and not have see more unity than you do in the church. Politically, racially, economically, it doesn't matter. We should should be able to gather together and say, why? Because we know Jesus is the answer. So we're looking to him. We're not looking to man or to woman. He is the answer. It's so important we understand this. Let me show it to you in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus knew this. I love that Jesus knew this. And he even even proclaimed it. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am life. Jesus knew he was the only way. He's the only way to have unity, in our, and, and, to, and I say unity, true unity, a true love that goes deeper than what we look like, goes deeper than what we believe, goes deeper than what we think, goes deeper than what we sound like, or goes deeper than our backgrounds. He is a true love, and it only comes from him. The Bible says that we love because he first loved us. He is the answer. You know what's kind of crazy, and it, I believe the church has got, and I don't, I'm just talking about our church, remember just the church as a whole as far as the, I'd say Christians, let's not say the church. I believe Christians, oftentimes what we've done in our country, in our society is this. We've almost made Jesus a candidate. The Lord was showing me this this week. We've almost made Jesus a candidate where it's like this. It's like, all right, Jesus, you, get, you have 15 minutes or you have 20 minutes or you have two years or however long you have. You have this time period. Okay, show me or prove to me why I should vote for you. Give me the reasons. Oh, you'll bless me. Okay, what else? Okay, you'll, you'll bring me a spouse. Okay, what else? Oh, you'll bring me children. Okay, what else? Okay, what are you going to do for me that makes me want to support you? See, we would, oh my goodness, I'm going to preach for a second. See, we were never, Christianity was never meant to be a support system for Jesus. Jesus didn't come to the disciples and say, hey, come vote for me. Come vote for me. I'll make your life great. Come vote for me. I'll make everything wonderful. Come vote for me. I'll bring unity in your nation. Come vote. No, here's what he said. Come follow me. See, there's a difference from voting and following. There's a difference from supporting and following. Supporting is you do for me and then I'll I'll do for you. Following is no matter what you do, I'm with you. See, followers know that, see, oh my goodness, I'm going to preach for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm a little hyped, okay, I'm sorry. Supporters, here's what supporters do. Supporters say this. Supporters say, okay, I'm going to watch you, and then when you do for me what, you want, what I want to do, okay, then I'm going to tithe, or, or then I'm going to get committed to a church. I'm going I'm to watch, and then I'm gonna, I'll give you my support. See, followers do this. Followers say, you know what? I understand what you already did for me. And nothing that anyone else on this planet can do more than what you have already done for me. So that means now, Jesus, if the life I'm living right now doesn't look the way that I want, it doesn't matter. Why? Because I know what you did for me was enough. We live in this 
democracy of a country where we've actually brought that into the church and we've said, okay, what are you going to do for me? No, no, no. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way, no way else. There is no other life. There is no other truth. He is. It's so important we understand this. That's why it's so important to be, be, allow this to be a part of your life. That's why it's so important to allow this to be, to, allow, to, to, to feed your, your soul. Why? Because this is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. See, this right here is not a policy. This is the foundation of life. See, we have allowed, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm wound up today. I don't know why. Here's what it is. We have allowed the word, hear me, we have allowed the word to be a policy that we can allow it to be a suggestion for when we feel like we're following it or not. No, no, no. The word is not something where we feel like it or we don't. The word is the truth. It is the way. It is the life. And so here's what we do. We look at it and we say, okay, I'm going to follow it with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. You want Jesus to be the answer. You have to follow Jesus in your life. We can't just support Jesus. Supporting Jesus is not what he came to do. He came to find followers that would say, I'm giving you my life because I know you are the only hope for my life and my future. Yeah. Jesus is the answer. Let's go. We got to go quickly. I got so many things. I got this question, thing I wrote down. When did we as Christians allow convenience to become more important than commitments? When did we allow convenience to become more important than Commitment. See, what I mean by that is, see, we, we, want, we want Jesus to convene, be convenient for us. We want to follow him when we feel good. We want to follow him when he takes care of us mentally. We want to follow him when we're blessed. And, and it's, commitment has to go beyond our convenience. Let's keep going. I got too many things to say. Let's go. Come on. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. You have to know, understand Jesus is the answer. But we really want unity. We have to understand Jesus is the answer. Then two, we have to understand unity is a choice. Unity is a choice. Here's what I wrote down, and I believe this. Unity is a choice we work at, not a feeling we fall into. Unity is a choice we work at. We have to all, hear me, as Christians, we have to choose to have unity and, and, and make unity a priority in our lives, not just we wait for it and we feel into it. It's so important we do this. And here's what I know. We can disagree and still love unconditionally in our lives. We have gotten to a place in our society, which I don't know where it came from. It had to be the enemy. Where we have gotten to the place where if you disagree with me, you're my enemy. That is not the case. A disagreement doesn't make you my, you're my enemy. I disagree with Ash all the time. I disagree with her. She says, you need to fix this. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I disagree all the time. But that doesn't make her my enemy. Here's what happens. We allow our disagreements to create us a thought process in us to make us think we're enemies. And then that's what causes division. We have to choose to say, I'm not going to let my disagreements divide me. In fact, you should want people around you that do, call, that do disagree with you. Because they're going to challenge your thought processes. If I'm around people that just agree with me all the time, more than likely I'm probably doing something I don't want to do or shouldn't do. I need people that are ch challenging me, that are helping me think differently, that are helping me see the word differently, that are helping me see the world differently. I want to always be challenged. Why? Because we all grew up different. Everybody in this room has grown up different. Nobody, I can't stand the thought process or the, or the phrase. I'm just going to talk to you for a second. I can't stand the phrase, oh, just put yourself in their shoes. Just put yourself, if you're an African-American, put yourself in a, in a, in a Caucasian's uh, shoes. If you're a Caucasian, put yourself in an African-American shoes. I can't stand that phrase. Why? Because neither person ever grew up the same way. How can I put myself in your shoes? I don't understand where you've been and what you've walked through. I don't want to try to, to put myself in your shoes and then try to figure, no, here's what I want to do. I want to stop. I want to listen to where you're at. I want to hear where you're coming from. I want to know what you're, you've walked through. And here's what I want to do. Then I want to love you where you are. This is what unity is. Unity isn't just let me try to figure out and put myself in your shoes because here's what you'll do. If we try to put each other in each other's shoes, here's what we do. Then we just try to fix the problem. Well, let me put yourself, or well, if I put myself in your shoes, and this is what I would do different, and this is what I would do different, and this is what I would do. No, 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 let's not, let's stop trying to fix each other, and let's start just trying to love one another. Amen. We've all been through different things. 
Everybody in this room, every single person in this room has been through something that someone else can't understand. Every single person, every one of us. It doesn't matter. And then what we do is division. We're like, well, you don't understand. Mine's been worse. I've been like this. And, and here's it. Now we're, now, we're, now we're leveling up on who has, has had worse situations happen to them in life. It's not the way God desires for us to live. God desires for us to say this. Okay, yeah, we've all walked through things. And so here's what it is. I want to love you where you are. I'm going to choose to love you where you are. I want to listen to you. I want to learn from you. And I want to choose to, to gr- continue to grow with you. Why? Because I love you and I want to create unity within the body of Christ. So important we understand this. Let's keep going. i got to go quick. Okay. Uh, let's choose not to let our disagreements divide us politically, racially. Uh, and again, we say relate racially. I don't mean your disagreements like you think racism is good or racism is bad. Racist, racism, racism is sin. It's pride. It's all sin. So we're not going into all that. We know that already. I've already talked about that. Disagreements even in the church. I would say this, which is kind of funny, and I'm just talking here for a second, but it's really funny. Like, I, I don't know if I've ever been a part or a day in the age with the church where there's been so much, so many disagreements in, within the church. Just with COVID. Like, COVID creates so many disagreements. Like, it's one, one person, like, open up the church. Like, the church is supposed to stand. Like, stand. Oh. And then the other person's like, the church is supposed to have people be people that have compassion. Why would you open the church? Ah, oh. it's like both sides are. And then when you see people posting about it, and then people like literally, like we're having a worship service, and people literally on the post are like, praise God, you're standing up. And the very next post is like, I can't believe you. <laughs> Wear masks. I can't believe they're making people wear masks. They're stealing our freedom. They're taking our freedom. We should be able to stand up for what we were. We should not have to wear masks. Then you got the person over here like, you should wear the mask. You're killing people if you don't wear the mask. And this is in the church. This isn't just the world. This is the church. See, we have allowed division from the world to get into the church. It's crazy. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. You should wear a mask. Oh. It's so important that we would not allow our disagreements to divide us. You know, it's s- silly things I've heard, you know, okay, with small groups with COVID, like, we should have small groups. We really need to be growing together individually. It's a smaller crowd. Like, we should be walking together. And then the next person will tell me, like, oh, we shouldn't have small groups. Like, you're letting people go in their homes, and, like, you never know what's going on in their home. And next thing you know, like, they could get sick. And, like, we shouldn't do that. We should stay away from that. Like, and it's like, okay, sorry. I don't, know. I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to follow what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. I'm sorry. But here's what's crazy. Here's what's crazy. If we allow, we allow our, divi- our disagreements to start creating division in our hearts, here's what happens. Then we start creating division in the church. And then the Bible says a house cannot stand if it's divided. So then we start allowing the enemy to start attacking the church. I've heard somebody say, oh, man, you were so funny this weekend. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, you did such a good job. You were so funny this weekend. So good, so good. The very next person comes to me is like, that was really good, but you could have like, been a little more serious. I don't know what to do. Like, you need to be a little deeper. Like, then the other person's like, you know what? Like, you should tell a few more jokes. Like, here's what it is. We've, again, I, I'm all for preferences. I'm all for preferences. I'm all about preferences. We have it with worship. People are like, you should sing more hymns. And we have other people, you should sing more new songs. You, you should turn the music up. You should turn the music down. I'm all for preferences. But when preferences get in the way of unity, we're wrong. My preferences should never get in the way of God's purpose. And so this is why it's important for all of us. Again, I'm just talking to you as far as when I'm talking about unity. We have to, it has to start in the church. Yes, I can have my preferences, but I don't want my preferences to get in the way of what God is calling me and the church to do, in the, uh, with the church to do and with me in it, as a part of it. Because I am the church. You are the church. We are the church. This building is not the church. We, a body of people who are all different, who are all uh, uniquely made, are what creates and makes the church. So important with the sins. We got to make sure I'm going to close. We got to make sure Jesus is the answer. We have to make sure unity is a choice. And then lastly, we have to see this in John chapter 17 and verse 11. This is Jesus praying. He's praying to the Father. And this is one of his last prayers to to the the Father. He says, I will remain in the world no longer. He's just about to, he's about to, he knows he's about to be crucified. 
He says, I will be in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. He's talking about the disciples here. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Isn't this crazy? Jesus actually, it's so, it's so cool. Jesus died about to die on the cross, and he, he, he knows that we're going to face division. And so one of his prayers, it wasn't God, I want you to bless the Christians. Lord, I want you to, I want you to protect them uh, from sickness. No, it was, Lord, make them one as we are one, as if he knew the importance of unity between you and I. He says it with the disciples. Let's go on to John chapter 17, verse 20. Skip down a few verses. My prayer, he's continuing to pray, is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. He says, I'm, I'm not just praying for the disciples, those that are with me. I'm praying for those, all those who will believe through the message that they will teach, meaning all the, the Christ, Christians after the disciples. I'm praying for them that they may all be one. It didn't say that they would all be rich. He didn't pray and say, God, make every Christian after me, after I go on, God, make them all successful in the business world. It doesn't say, God, make them all live perfect lives. No, it says, God, make them one. He's showing us a picture of the importance of unity. Just keep going very quickly. This is Father, just as you sent me. It's just, as you, just as you are one in me, and me, I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, here's Jesus. He knows the importance of unity. He knows that he is the answer. He knows that unity is a choice. And then he knows this. Unity has a purpose. Unity is not just, hear me, hear me. Unity is not just so we can all get along and feel good about ourselves. He says here that they may know, let them be one, so they may know, the world may believe that you have sent me. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, let the world see that they are one, that they have unity when no one else does, that they have racial unity when the world doesn't, when they have economic unity when the world doesn't, when they have uh, a political unity when the world doesn't. Let the, the world see that they are one. Why? So that the world will know that Jesus was sent by the Father. See, per, unity has a purpose, and that purpose is a mission, and that mission is this. Through us loving one another, the world sees Jesus. See, the world doesn't see Jesus just because you can preach good, or you can talk good, or you can smile good. The world sees Jesus in us and believes in Jesus when they see us loving one another. Unity is so much more important than us just feeling good about ourselves. Unity is about us showing the world Jesus. And I hate to tell you, maybe you don't know this, but I'm going to break it to you real soft-like. Here's what it is. The world needs Jesus. If you haven't looked in a while, you need to go take a peek. The world needs Jesus. We need a hope that we do not have on this earth. And we know as Christians that hope is none other than the name of Jesus, the one who came and died so that we could have eternal life in him. Not only eternal life, but life here more abundantly. I'm going to get excited because I want you to understand the importance of unity is not just so we can feel good. No, the importance of unity is so that the world can meet Jesus. Let us, hear me, hear me. I don't care if you're 12 years old or 80 years old. Let us be a people. Let's say, God, we want people to see you through us. That we want to love in such a way as Christians, as believers, that we want people to see you through us. Here's what I know. And this may sound crazy to you. No matter who you vote for, and go vote. Everybody on November 3rd, you should go vote. Everybody should vote. Every, you give, you're given the right to vote. I'm not saying don't vote for those that are young. I'm saying vote. Vote your morals. People have been asking me, well, who do I vote for? Here's what you need to do. Pray to the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to talk to you very practically. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray, 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 pray. Search out and read about the, the things that they're, the policies that they're trying to create. And then vote your moral standards. Okay? Here's what I know. And this might sound crazy to you. I'm more concerned. 
I'll say it this way. I'm less concerned about who you vote for than I am how you treat the one who votes different than you. Don't you know so-and-so has been sent by God? Here's what I know. The greatest commandment is that we would love the Father, the Lord, our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole spirit, our whole strength. And it's also to love our neighbor as ourselves. So that means it's more important to me that I love you than it is who you vote for. I'm going to be honest with you. This might sound crazy to you, and that's okay, because you can think I'm crazy, because I kind of am, to be honest. Eh, Okay. I'm I'm less concerned with the background of where you come from. I'm less concerned of the color of your skin than I am you loving someone and how you treat someone of a different race than you are. I'm less concerned about how much money you make and more concerned and more, and more, and more uh, not concerned, but more, I, I want more for you to treat those who make different than you do. Let us be a people that do not allow our differences to cause us to divide ourselves to where we distance ourselves to where we start to have disagreements and we cause division in the church in the world let us be a people that understand this god we want people to see you through us and so here's what i want to do whether i agree with you or not whether you i think you're my enemy or not god i want to create unity within the body why because when the body has unity god the body is able to function to the place and the purpose of what you have and god we know your purpose is that people would see you and us we don't want hear me as a church I don't want people just to come here and see Jesus I want people to see Jesus everywhere we go because that's what Jesus' heart is that we would have so much unity that we can love one another in such a way that they see Jesus on our posts uh oh (gasps) just because you disagree with someone on Facebook doesn't mean you have to have a panic attack it's all good love the people more you you being right or wrong is less important as you treating people with love because Jesus desires for you to. I'm wound up today. I'm sorry. I want to provoke you. I want to push you. I want to challenge you. Let us be a people. Hear me. Let us be a people that really believe in unity. And not only believe in unity, but walk out and live unity. Why? Because we know Jesus is seen through us when we choose. Amen. Can we pray today, Father?